It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this session is Global Health, Education, Economics, and Development, Basic Concepts, Part 1. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include discuss how education is linked to health and economics, review basic concepts of micronutrient and protein energy malnutrition, and discuss the link of parent education to the health of children. Let's start by making a few general statements. Health, education, economics, and country development are all closely linked. Health is a major contributor to the development of human capital. Human capital is defined as the skills, knowledge, and experience possessed by an individual or population viewed in terms of their value or cost to an organization or country. So human capital can be a positive or negative influence on a nation's developmental status. Education is closely linked to health and economics. Out-of-pocket health expenditures can have a major impact on individual and family economics and may lead to poverty. Provision of health services or health service access raises questions of equity. Health is a major national expenditure for all countries. Let's now consider how education is linked to health and economics. A parent's educational level is commonly linked to and predicts their child's future education level, occupation, and health. This is commonly defined as an intergenerational link. Hufal et al. studied links between the education of parents and their children in Zimbabwe from 1998 to 2011, a time of economic collapse in the country. Throughout the period, children with more educated parents continued to have better outcomes. An interesting study from Great Britain in 2014 demonstrated that the father's level of education is the strongest factor determining a child's future success at school. The report from the Office for National Statistics claims that children are seven and a half times less likely to be successful at school if their father failed to achieve an education compared with children with highly educated fathers. A mother's education level was important to a lesser degree, with a child approximately three times as likely to have a low educational outcome if the mother had a low level of education. Dubot et al. demonstrated that a parent's, mother's and father's educational level when their children were eight years old significantly predicted the future educational level and occupational success of their children up to 40 years later. Arola et al. using Finnish registry data matched the occupation of 29,282 children through 29 years old with information on their parents' education, class, and income. Parental education was most associated with their child's occupation later in life versus class or income. This slide summarizes the results of a 2011 study by Eugenie Mega in Burkina Faso of 8,500 households with 6,750 children. The study concluded that the education level of mothers achieved by 13 years of age significantly affected their child's weight for height, a strong indicator of malnutrition. So education policies aimed at improving the education of girls at least to 13 years of age is important for preventing malnutrition 
of their children. Let's spend a few minutes discussing malnutrition. There are multiple forms of malnutrition, and roughly one-third of the world's population is currently experiencing one or more of them. This slide outlines several key interrelated factors associated with malnutrition. As illustrated, poverty is often a central factor. The underlying causes of poverty are complex, multifactorial and bidirectional, associated with injustice, war, natural or man-made disasters, etc., that result in societal dysfunction, upsetting the economics of countries, communities, and families. Poverty results in multiple negative impacts on people, including on healthy environments, like those seen in the slums of large urban areas worldwide, that can lead to increased and frequent infections. Poverty is commonly associated with inadequate child, maternal, and general health care, inadequate education of women, and household food insecurity that frequently results in dietary deficiencies. A deficient diet enhanced by frequent infections often results in malnutrition that can be mild to severe. Malnutrition also decreases an individual's immune function, which can increase the risk of infections. Malnutrition can be divided into two major categories, micronutrient and protein energy malnutrition. Protein energy malnutrition, when more severe, can be further divided into marasmus and kwashiorkor. Let's take a few minutes to briefly discuss micronutrients. Micronutrients are often referred to as vitamins and minerals and are vital to healthy development, disease prevention, and well-being. Micronutrients are not produced in the body and must be derived from the diet. At least half of the children worldwide, younger than five years of age, suffer from vitamin and mineral deficiencies. This slide lists the six common micronutrient deficiencies seen in children worldwide, including iron, folate, vitamin A, vitamin D, iodine, and zinc. Iron is critical for motor and cognitive development. Children and pregnant women are especially vulnerable to the consequences of iron deficiency. Iron is a leading cause of anemia, which is defined as low blood hemoglobin concentration, a substance in red blood cells that enables them to carry oxygen. Iron deficiency anemia affects approximately 43% of children younger than five years of age and 38% of pregnant women globally. Anemia during pregnancy increases the risk of death for the mother and low birth weight for the infant. Iron deficiency anemia signs and symptoms may include fatigue, weakness, pale skin, chest pain, rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, headache, dizziness or lightheadedness, cold hands and feet, inflammation or soreness of the tongue, brittle nails, craving non-nutritive substances such as ice, dirt, or starch, and poor appetite, especially in infants and children. Iron deficiency is commonly diagnosed by laboratory tests, including hemoglobin, hematocrit, and serum iron studies. Iron deficiency is treated with iron supplementation medications. Preventing iron deficiency through adequate dietary sources of iron helps improve children's learning ability and cognitive development. People absorb two to three times more iron from animal sources than from plant sources. When consuming plant sources of iron, 
Adding vitamin C to the diet enhances the iron absorption rate. Some of the best animal sources of iron are lean beef, turkey, chicken, pork, and fish. Some of the best plant-based sources of iron include beans, lentils, dark green leafy vegetables, fortified breakfast cereals, enriched rice, whole grain, and enriched breads. Fortifying flour with iron, folic acid, and vitamin B12 is globally recognized as an effective, low-cost intervention to prevent anemia. Folate, or vitamin B9, also provided in another form as folic acid, is essential in the earliest days of fetal growth for healthy development of the fetal brain and spine. Neural tube defects are serious birth defects and affect an estimated 300,000 births each year worldwide and cause approximately 13% of neonatal deaths attributed to birth defects in low resource countries. Neural tube defects commonly result in infant paralysis if the child survives. A majority of these defects are preventable with adequate folic acid consumption during the preconception period and throughout the first few weeks of gestation. Initial symptoms of folate deficiency include fatigue, tongue swelling, headaches, irritability, sores in the mouth. Symptoms due to anemia as a result of folate deficiency are similar to those of iron deficiency and include weakness, pallor of the skin, shortness of breath, palpitations, lethargy, symptoms of children born to women who had folate deficiency during pregnancy include low birth weight, neural tube defects, microcephaly, and developmental delays and seizures. Ensuring sufficient levels of folate in women prior to conception can reduce neural tube defects such as spina bifida and anencephaly. Providing folic acid supplements to women 15 to 49 years old and fortifying foods such as wheat flour with folic acid reduces the incidence of neural tube birth defects, neonatal deaths, and some forms of anemia. The World Health Organization, WHO, recommends iron and folic acid supplements. So once again, fortifying flour with iron and folic acid is globally recognized as an effective, low-cost intervention, though unfortunately, many populations, particularly those in low and middle resource settings, do not have access to fortified foods or vitamin supplements containing folic acid. Globally, vitamin A deficiency affects an estimated 190 million preschool age children. Symptoms of vitamin A deficiency include dry skin, increased acne, dry eyes, night blindness, infertility, delayed growth, decreased function of the immune system, and decreased wound healing. Children with vitamin A deficiency face an increased risk of blindness and death from infections, such as measles and diarrhea. Providing vitamin A supplements to children ages 6 to 59 months old is highly effective in reducing deaths from all causes where vitamin A deficiency is prevalent. Provision of vitamin A supplements is an inexpensive, quick, and effective way to improve vitamin A status and reduce child morbidity and mortality in the long term. Areas where vitamin A is a public health problem, and particularly where the prevalence of night blindness in children is 1% or higher, or where the serum retinol levels 
are 0 0.70 micromoles per liter or lower in at least 20% of infants and children 6 to 59 months of age, vitamin A supplementation is recommended for that age group. 100,000 international units of retinol equivalent once for those 6 to 11 months old and 200,000 international units of retinol equivalent every 4 to 6 months for those 12 to 59 months old. That intervention has been shown to reduce the risk of all-cause mortality by 24%. Comprehensive control of vitamin A deficiency should include strategies for general dietary improvement. Combining the administration of vitamin A with immunization services is an important part of the effort to eliminate vitamin A deficiency and save lives. Millions of children have received vitamin A through National Immunization Days to eradicate poliomyelitis. Providing high-dose vitamin A supplementation to mothers soon after delivery provides a further benefit to young infants through enriched breast milk. Let's now briefly discuss vitamin D deficiency. This is a simplified diagram of vitamin D metabolism. Vitamin D comes from two sources the metabolism of 7-dehydrocholesterol via exposure of the skin to ultraviolet B light from the sun, and also the dietary intake from fish, meat, eggs, and vitamin D-fortified foods. Vitamin D must then undergo metabolism in the liver to 25-hydroxyvitamin D and then be further metabolized to 125-dihydroxyvitamin D in the kidney. 125-dihydroxyvitamin D is the active compound that maintains calcium and phosphate functions in the body, including building and maintaining healthy bones, augmenting the immune system to resist bacteria and viruses, and is essential for adequate muscle and nerve functions. Because many countries have an inadequate supply of foods rich in vitamin D and or exposure to natural ultraviolet B, UVB radiation from sunlight, an important proportion of the global population is at risk of vitamin D deficiency. It's estimated that about 1 billion people worldwide have low levels of vitamin D in their blood. There is general agreement that the minimum serum plasma 25-hydroxyvitamin D concentration that protects against vitamin D deficiency-related bone disease is approximately 30 nanomoles per liter. Therefore, this threshold is suitable to define vitamin D deficiency in population surveys. According to a 2011 study, 41.6% of adults in the U.S. are deficient. This number goes up to 69.2% in Hispanics and 82.1% in African Americans. Symptoms and signs of vitamin D deficiency include mood changes, bone and joint symptoms that can cause pain, osteomalacia or bone loss in adults, and rickets in children, muscle cramps, fatigue, altered immunity that may manifest with increased infections like those of the respiratory tract, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. If a high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency is identified by a population having greater than 20% prevalence of serum 25-hydroxyvitamin D at less than 30 nanomoles per liter, or the risk for vitamin D deficiency is determined to be high based on proxy indicators like the prevalence of rickets greater than 1%, Food vitamin D fortification and or targeted vitamin D supplementation policies can be implemented to reduce the burden of vitamin D deficiency-related conditions in vulnerable populations. 
Vitamin D rich foods and drinks include salmon or mackerel, canned tuna fish, and egg yolks, as well as vitamin D fortified foods like cereals, juice, milk, and other dairy products. This is a simplified diagram of iodine and thyroid hormone metabolism. Dietary iodine is absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. In the thyroid gland, iodine along with tyrosine is metabolized to active thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. T3 has three iodine molecules and T4 has four iodine molecules. T3 and T4 hormones then impact the body through a variety of key metabolic actions. Globally, an estimated 1.8 billion people have insufficient iodine intake. Symptoms of iodine deficiency are caused primarily by decreased thyroid hormone or hypothyroidism, including goiter or swelling of the thyroid gland in the neck, fatigue, weight gain, hair loss, dry skin, impaired memory, and cold intolerance. Goiter is a common symptom of iodine deficiency. When deficient of iodine, the thyroid gland located in the neck fails to make enough thyroid hormone to meet body demands. This inability to meet demands causes the thyroid cells to grow and multiply, resulting in goiter. Fatigue or feeling weak or tired is reported in 95% of people suffering from hypothyroidism due to iodine deficiency. More than 85% of the population with low thyroid and iodine levels can experience dry skin. Thyroid hormones not only help the skin cells to regenerate, but also hydrate the skin by regulating the sweat mechanism. Thus, individuals with hypothyroidism sweat less, causing dry skin. Iodine deficiency can lead to cognitive impairment in children, resulting in learning disability, psychomotor impairment, impaired memory, etc. Thyroid hormones aid in brain development. Iodine deficiency and hypothyroidism during pregnancy can result in irreversible fetal brain damage. Iodine is required during pregnancy and infancy for the infant's healthy growth, cognitive development, and thyroid function. Fortifying salt with iodine is a successful intervention worldwide. Currently, about 86% of households worldwide consume iodized salt. Symptoms and signs of zinc deficiency include dry scaly skin, alopecia or hair loss, oral lesions including stomatitis, oral ulcers, and chelosis, decreased taste and smell, immune abnormalities that lead to increased infections, diarrhea which can be severe, loss of appetite, decreased cognition, and delayed growth in children. Zinc promotes immune functions and helps people resist infectious diseases, including diarrhea, pneumonia, and malaria. Zinc is also needed for healthy pregnancies. Globally, 17.3% of the population is at risk for zinc deficiency due to dietary inadequacy. Up to 30% of people are at risk in some regions of the world. This slide from USAID shows the prevalence of zinc deficiency worldwide, with higher prevalence of greater than or equal to 25% in Central and South America, Southern Africa, India, and areas of Southeast Asia. This slide lists several strategies to prevent zinc deficiency globally. Add zinc to soil called agronomic biofortification, which both increases crop yields and provides more dietary zinc. Add zinc to food called food fortification. The Republic of China, India, Mexico, and about 20 other countries, mostly on the east coast of sub-Saharan Africa, fortify wheat flour and or maize flour with zinc. 
Although whole grains and cereals are high in zinc, they also contain chelating phytates, which bind zinc and reduce its bioavailability. Adding zinc-rich foods to the diet. The foods with the highest concentrations of zinc are proteins, especially animal meats, the highest being oysters. Per ounce, beef, pork, and lamb contain more zinc than fish. The dark meat of chicken has more zinc than the light meat. Other good sources of zinc are nuts, whole grains, legumes, and yeast. Oral tablets or liquids containing zinc gluconate, including multivitamin supplements, have been used. Providing zinc supplements reduces the incidence of premature birth, decreases childhood diarrhea and respiratory infections, lowers the number of deaths from all causes, and increases growth and weight gain among infants and young children. Let's now consider the protein energy malnutrition conditions Merasmus and Kwashiorkor. Merasmus is primarily due to a general deficiency of sources of energy or calories. Kwashiorkor is due to deficient protein in the diet, which distinguishes it from Merasmus. Merasmus is a more frequent cause of malnutrition in dry climates than Kwashiorkor. There are approximately 50 million children less than five years old who have protein energy malnutrition worldwide. Of the malnourished children in the world, approximately 80% live in Asia, 15% in Africa, and 5% in Latin America. Merasmus is a form of severe malnutrition characterized by overall calorie or energy deficiency. Merasmus can occur in anyone with severe malnutrition, but usually occurs in children. In Merasmus, body weight is reduced to less than 62% of the normal expected body weight for age. Merasmus is more frequently seen in children less than five years old, but primarily in infants less than one year of age. Symptoms and signs of Merasmus include wasted appearance with a loss of muscle mass and subcutaneous fat. Buttocks and upper limb muscle groups are usually more affected than others. Dehydration is often seen with marasmus, characterized by thirst and shrunken eyes. Severe dehydration can result in shock with a decreased pulse pressure, cold extremities, and decreased consciousness. Other manifestations include heart failure, increased infections, including pneumonia, skin, ear, and nasal infections, etc., abdominal distension, decreased bowel sounds, and blood or mucus in the stools, corneal lesions of the eye associated with vitamin A deficiency, skin hemorrhage, purpura, and dryness, brittle hair, and irritability. Merasmus is caused by multiple factors singly or in concert and include the multiple causes of poverty previously mentioned, parental issues including maternal malnutrition, maternal anemia, child abuse, and poor parental health knowledge. Merasmus can also be caused by a number of pathological conditions and or complications including serious infections like malaria, pneumonia, meningitis, diarrhea, and chronic congenital diseases of major organs like the nervous system, heart, lungs, liver, kidney, gastrointestinal system, etc. Severe marasmus is often fatal, particularly when the body is no longer able to synthesize proteins. At this point, refeeding will fail. Treatment and prevention of marasmus include address the underlying causes to prevent relapse, Many times this will require addressing poverty or other social determinants of health by using community engagement techniques. Community engagement is covered in more detail in other sessions of the North Dakota Public Health Training Network. Treat the clinical conditions of the child. 
This may include rehydration, often requiring intravenous fluid. Secondary infections are common in these children, requiring the use of antibiotics. Initiate a refeeding program. Children with marasmus must be refed slowly to prevent a situation called refeeding syndrome. Refeeding syndrome is a metabolic disturbance that occurs as a result of reinstitution of nutrition in people and animals who are starved, severely malnourished, or metabolically stressed because of severe illness. When too much food or liquid nutrition supplement is eaten during the initial four to seven days following a malnutrition event, the production of glycogen, fat, and protein in cells may cause low serum concentrations of potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus, causing cardiac, pulmonary, and or neurologic symptoms that can be fatal. There are many refeeding plans for marasmus, but the general concepts are similar. One common plan uses dried skim milk in boiled water for a few days. Once the milk diet is tolerated, a vegetable mixture is added, which may include sesame, casein, and sugar. This diet is then slowly advanced to a balanced diet with adequate calories. Quashiorcor is a form of severe protein malnutrition. A Jamaican pediatrician, Dr. Cicely Williams, described the condition in 1935. The term Quashiorcor is derived from the Ga language of Ghana and translates as the sickness the baby gets when the new baby comes. Quashiorcor can develop when older children are weaned from protein-rich breast milk and placed on diets high in carbohydrates like corn and low in protein. Quashiorcor cases occur in areas of famine and are rare in developed countries. Though Quashiorcor can often be successfully treated, it may have a permanent impact on a child's physical and mental development. Signs and symptoms of kwashiorkor include pitting edema of the ankles and feet, which is a defining sign of the illness. It also commonly presents with gastrointestinal signs, including abdominal distension and diarrhea and liver enlargement. A change of hair color to a lighter or rusty tone, along with hair thinning, is common. Other signs and symptoms include skin depigmentation and dermatitis with flaking of the skin, anorexia or decreased appetite, fatigue, loss of muscle mass, failure to grow or gain weight, decreased immune response resulting in increased secondary infections, irritability, and in severe cases, shock. Severe kwashiorkor is often fatal. Both clinical subtypes of severe acute malnutrition, kwashiorkor, and marasmus are treated similarly. Address the underlying cause to prevent relapse. Treat the clinical condition of the child, including correcting hypoglycemia, hypothermia, and dehydration. Correct electrolyte imbalances. Treat secondary infections with antibiotics. Correct micronutrient deficiencies. Start cautious feedings, like with marasmus, and slowly advance those feedings to initiate catch-up growth. Provide sensory stimulation and emotional support. Let's return to the discussion of mother's education and child health. This slide from the World Health Organization data in 2006 for Bolivia, Burkina Faso, Cambodia, Haiti, and Pakistan. This clearly shows the association of a mother's educational level and the measles immunization status of their children. Women with no education had measles immunization rates ranging from 13 to 31 percentage points less than women who were educated. 
This chart is from the CDC and underlines the importance of immunizations and immunization programs in global health. From 2011 to 2020, 23.3 million deaths were averted worldwide by immunizations. Immunizations for measles and hepatitis B accounted for 18.3 million or 75.5% of deaths prevented by immunizations during that 10 year period. GLU compiled data from several developing countries and for every 10% increase in the education level of mothers, there was a reduction of the infant mortality rate, IMR, of 4.1 per thousand live births. The education of women is particularly important to improve the health of their children. The results of studies like these provide strong support for the unique predictive role of parental education on the education, occupation, and health outcomes of their children. In summary, health education and economics are all closely linked. One third of the world's population is currently experiencing malnutrition. Parental education is predictive of the education, occupation, and health outcomes of their children. Poverty results in multiple negative impacts on people.